Good morning, evening, and afternoon, depending on when you're watching our Sermonic Moment broadcast. My name is Dominique Green, and I'm blessed to pastor the historic Trinity African Methodist Episcopal Church, located here at the heart of Manning, South Carolina, where we believe that God is our Father, Christ is still in the redemption business, and the Holy Ghost has the power to do something about all of our situations. Our prayer here at Trinity is simple. We pray that you would connect with our family so that we might become a part of yours. This is the day that the Lord has made. We shall rejoice and be glad in it. And as we continue to worship God on this first Sunday in November and give thanks to a God who has been gracious to us as we continue in this journey towards Thanksgiving, I would encourage everyone, just as a shameless plug, if you have not gotten vaccinated, it's not too late to go get your vaccine, or perhaps you're looking to get that booster vaccine, please go ahead and do that. Um, also, our babies are now eligible to get vaccinated. More information is forthcoming, very fresh, hot off the press. One of those things we learned, I believe it was Thursday or Friday, where the FDA approved the vaccine for children 5 to 11. So please make sure you're taking the initiative to get your children vaccinated. Additionally, I want to announce that uh, many of us in the cluster here in the Manning area have been working cooperatively through the grants that we got through the county. And the first of a series of vaccination clinics will be occurring on this Saturday from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m at Biggers AME Church. Don't ask me the address. You know where it is over there on King, um, King Street Highway here in Manning. But if you have not been vaccinated after you have attended the Trinity AME Church prayer breakfast, which is also that same day, we're gonna invite you over to Biggers. We'll be having one here at Trinity at our vaccination clinic here at Trinity. We'll be focused primarily on boosters and children's vaccinations, but more information will be coming to you soon. We are excited about what God is doing and we are grateful that has become out of this post-convocation moment here in the 7th Episcopal District, which means for those who may not be AME, just the nation state of South Carolina, that we are a part of in the AME churches that are here. We're grateful to be recharged, fired up, and ready to go as we kickstart and embrace a new conference year. If you have your Bibles, I'm going to invite you to journey with me. We've been in the books of Acts. It is a theme that we're going to stick with the majority of this conference year as we keep inviting ourselves to look at this theme um, interrupted by the gospel, the, looking at how the gospel has the power to interrupt our lives, change our daily habits, change the way we interact with the world and allowing that interruption to occur and allowing ourselves to be open to the move of God as mediated through Christ's Holy Spirit. So if you'll meet me, Acts chapter two, uh, we tend to think of this scripture in the context of Pentecost, gather your family, perhaps shoot out a tweet like this or share this sermon on Facebook. We are excited for what God is doing, Acts chapter two. Also, let me uh, remind everyone it is not too late to buy your tickets for the Trinity AME Church Prayer Breakfast. I cannot remember the time, but we will post this in the message um, associated with the video once it goes live. But we are so grateful what God is doing. I believe it is this Saturday. I, well, I know it's this Saturday. It's either starting at 10 a.m. No, by lie. The tech team is telling me it's starting at 9 a.m. at Harvin's Haven. If you do not know how to get to Harvin's Haven, don't ask me because I can't tell you. I have always been driven. It is back in the cut. No disrespect to brother or sister Harvin. They have some amazing food. We have an amazing prayer breakfast, and we truly will be blessed. We're going to be joined by the Reverend Dr. Mary Rose. And let me explain the significance of that, who for many of us, we just think of old Dr. Rose, our homegirl from up the street at Friendship. Dr. Rose is the president of an Episcopal District organization. She is the president of the Seventh Episcopal District Women in Ministry. It is a big deal to be having the Episcopal president, the president of a component head coming to your church. And I think sometimes, you know, we can get very familiar and I'm laughing joke with Dr. Rose all the time, but truly, 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 it is a blessing to have the Episcopal District President of the Women in Ministry going to be our keynote speaker for this particular prayer breakfast. Meet us there, Harvest Haven, 9 a.m. Tickets are $15. If you do not have tickets, please feel free to shoot me or your classic text message, and we can get those to you. Tickets will also be sold at the door. See Sister Frazil Edwards for more information. Um, Thank you, sound team, for letting me know the time of that. And thank you to all our technicians and young people who help make these broadcasts possible. Also, this Tuesday, you know, I probably should have wrote this down, but this Tuesday, are we meeting at 6.30 or 7? 6.30 is what the sound team is telling me. <coughs> Excuse me. Tuesday, 6.30, we're going to meet for just one hour for a time of prayer to discuss some action items 
and look at how we're going to be reconvening here in the sanctuary as we seek to reopen and get back to um, what I would call as a new normal moving forward. Please feel free to drop your tithes off from 3 to 4 p.m. on today. This Sunday, the finance team will be meeting here at the church. It is because of your gifts of grace and mercy and your faithfulness that we are able to do the ministry that we do here at Trinity. If you don't like, like what the church is doing, there's probably a good reason. I promise you it's not because my heart is in the wrong place. It is because we do not have the funds. And you would be shocked the stuff we're doing is zero dollars. Given um, in a transparent moment, our giving is not what it should be. And for those who are giving faithfully, I want to say thank you. Your gifts make the difference. And for those of us who may say, well, you know what? I know I need to do better. There's no better time than the present to do that. Because one of the great lies that we tell ourselves is that we're tithing with our time. And people tell me that all the time. And let me say this very succinctly as we seek to be truth tellers um, in this conference, which you should be doing all along. Um, but I probably haven't done this thoroughly as I would like. God didn't ask you to just tithe your time. God asked for 100% of you to give him your everything. And he just asked in the process of you giving him your everything, you would give him 10% of your time, talent, and treasure, as we like to say in the black church, those triple T's. And many times, the truth be, be told, the times we say we're tithing our time, we're really not even doing that either. And so let's do better. There's nothing wrong with making a mistake, but it's a problem to continue making mistakes. All of us, unless you work in sales, are on a fixed income. So social security is not an excuse to not be faithful. Having kids is not an excuse to, to not be faithful. Having a job is not an excuse to not be faithful. Being a millionaire is not an excuse to not be faithful. Being trifling is not an excuse to not be faithful. God didn't just die for those who are faithful. He died for the faithless. And we show our evidences of gratitude towards God when we're able to trust God with our giving. And for those who may say, oh, this is sound like a pleading of begging for money. It's not. But it's a time where we have to be honest about our stewardship. Um, I remind us with a pathetic statistic that was given to us coming out of the Central Conference that the entire Central Conference, roughly about 63 churches, only brought in 20 new members. 20 new people joined the entire Central Conference. We should be embarrassed. And in saying that, we're called to accountability to ask ourselves, have we been faithful with our stewardship? Not just from the financial point, but from the perspective of missions and evangelism. And the honest answer is, Trinity, we have not. And we need to do better. It's not okay to not make disciples. The last new member to join this church was Sister Walker, if I'm not mistaken. Think about that, Trinity. That was over 16 years ago. Shameful. But by owning where we are, we have an opportunity to get things right, which leads us to our text where we need our patterns of regularity to be interrupted by the gospel. Because absent that, we're not going to make it doing things the way we've been doing it. Meet me in God's word. Um, Acts chapter number two. I'll be reading from the new international version, which is our tradition here at Trinity. Your version might be slightly different. However, own as it lifts up the name of Jesus that is all right with me. Acts chapter number two, looking at this theme interrupted by the gospel. Acts chapter number two. First 12 verses read, excuse me, first 13 verses read. When the day of Pentecost came, they being the disciples were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven, filled the whole house where they were sitting. They that saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now they were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard the sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment, because each one heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, Aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? Then, 
How is it each of us hears them in our native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia, Perigia, Pamphylia, Egypt, and other parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs. We hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongue. Amazed and perplexed, they ask one another, what does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said they have had too much wine. Allow me to lift back up verse number 12. Amazed and perplexed, they ask one another, what does this mean? Interrupted by the gospel is our theme, and in particular for this message, I want to ask us, what does this mean? Grass withers and the flower fades, but the good news of the gospel that the word of our God shall stand forever. Let us pray. Hide me now, O God, behind Calvary's old rugged cross, so that the people might not see the mess that has dominated grief, but allow them to see the God that is crucified in Christ Jesus, high and lifted up and with your train filling this temple. Trusting you now, God, for preaching. We've seen you work in others. Now, God, we're asking that you might work in me. Do it again, God, so that thy name might be glorified, thy people might be edified, and the devil might be horrified. For it's in Jesus' name we pray and give thanks. And all of God's children said, Amen and Amen. What does this mean? Meet me in the Word. You may even have to go back a sermon message or two. But as we've been on this journey, hearing what the physician Luke would seek to say to us as a body of Christ via the book of Acts, we have to put in context where the Pentecost moment falls in the narrative life of the church relative to Jesus's ascension. Acts, after all, is written by the physician Luke. This is the same person who is accredited as writing the gospel that bears the physician Luke's name. In ancient times, they would even have been contained in the same scroll. We tend to sort it out. Our Bible was Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, then Exodus. But at that time, when they were carrying books on scrolls and papyruses before it could be bound in its modern form, you would also find together the books of Luke Acts on one scroll. So when you got done reading the book of Luke, you can go straight into the book of Acts. It was meant to be a continuum that would take us from the birth of Jesus, really even before that, the annunciation of Jesus's birth to Mary and Joseph by way of the angel, Jesus's birth and nativity, his crucifixion, resurrection. Then after he's resurrected, spend times with the disciples. He tells them to gather and wait for a little while. He's going to send them a comforter. And after their faithfulness in waiting, God prepared them in Acts chapter 1. And the evidence of the preparation is while preparing, they were not idle, but in a prayerful, discerning state there. Prayer calls them to realize they were missing some of the things that would be essential in order for them to get to the next level. And upon realizing that they were missing that which was necessary, oh, you probably know what it was. Did you not read Acts 1? Here, let me tell you what it says. It says they realized they needed another disciple, so they had to choose between a brother named Matthias and another brother named Justice. And they did it by casting lots, and they would ultimately end up choosing the brother by the name of Matthias. But the reason they knew they needed someone else is because they found themselves operating in a place of obedience to God, which leads us to this place where if you want to find out what you're missing so you can get to the place ultimately where God is trying to get you to go first and foremost, you need to know as the first 11 verses of the books of Acts teach us is one, you got to be willing to wait on the Lord. Two, while waiting, don't be idle, but be prayerful. And three, once your prayer is answered, operate in the spirit of God to do what is necessary so you're able to get to the next level for yourself. Now, they're ready to go out and fulfill what Matthew and Mark would say in that great commission. Go ye therefore into the world, preaching my gospel, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And because they are now ready and prepared, God is getting ready to give them the increase. 
The text that we lifted up looks at the build up to the Pentecost moment. For the Bible reader, you will know that more than 3,000 people would get saved on the day of Pentecost. But before we get to the power and the impacts of the prophetic moment that comes through preaching, there are some precursors that we learn between the fruit of the harvest, the season of waiting in this interim, they had to act. They had been waiting on God. They had been told they needed to be faithful in their waiting. And before the increase would come in the subsequent verses in chapter 2, there was something that they had to do between their waiting and their harvest. Come here, somebody. There's some people that are still on the plantation waiting to be saved. But before you can experience freedom that comes once you cross into Pennsylvania, you have to recognize for yourself that you've got to be willing to move. The disciples don't stay in the place where they end in chapter 1. In chapter 1, they're meeting in the room by themselves. They're in a prayerful state. They're inside the four walls of the church because the church, after all, is just where two or three are gathered. And because there's 12 of them, they are definitely the church. But the church had to leave the walls in order to make an impact. And I would argue, my brothers and sisters, when we have been out of a traditional worshiping context now for more than a year, we reach a place and a time in our lives where we need to start moving in a different direction so we don't have to deal with the piss poor performance that comes with recognizing the Central South Carolina Conference of the African Methodist Episcopal Church only evangelized and made 20 new disciples. We're doing something wrong. And the reason we're doing something wrong is because you're doing something wrong. I'm doing something wrong. The church is doing something wrong. And when we look honestly at ourselves, it is not that other people don't want to come here. It is not because we don't have the money we believe we should have. The reason we have the issue that we have is because perhaps we ourselves are not the spiritual super warriors and super men and women that we think we are. Perhaps the reason we have struggled inviting other people to come to church is because we ourselves are not necessarily ready to return to the sanctuary. That's good, but have you been engaged in virtual church? Have you called and checked on somebody? Have you paid your tithes and offerings? Well, for the person that never paid their tithes and offering before the pandemic. This was a new, this was just a great excuse and now you could be able to say I don't have no money but you at least got the five dollars that comes with saving from the fact that you don't have to pay gas to get to the place that you're only showing up to twice a week so I'm going to invite you to consider returning now to church but not in the same way that you left it but with a renewed mindset that says I'm coming today to worship God in spirit and in truth and I don't need to worship God like I used to because prayerfully between now and the third Sunday in 2020 when we initially got the word that we were not going to be returning for in-person worship for a season. You've been taught some lessons that have made you stronger and if no lesson has made you stronger at least my father's children I pray you can say I'm still here and that's a reason to praise him. Our presence when all else fails the best testimony and reason of why God is real because I promise you, if God didn't want us to be here, you ain't cute enough, you ain't fine enough, you ain't big enough, and you are not bad enough to defeat some of the stuff that had assignments to take you out. That car almost hit you. The reason it didn't hit you wasn't because you had enough money to pay your light bill. It's because the Lord was on your side. And so coming from that place in chapter 1, they decided they got to move. And when they start moving, they move in what the first few verses call a place of unity. It says one accord. One of the most, I would argue, misinterpreted things in all the scripture. A lot of people are not experiencing the power of God because they're waiting for a misinterpretation of what one accord means. One accord does not mean everybody won't like each other. One accord does not mean that everybody is going to get along. What one accord means is there was a unity of purpose that they had a made up mind that they collectively were going to serve the Lord. Notice this. I would also submit to you that if there was one that didn't want to move, they would still have moved because the movement was from the people who were ready to go. 
That means if there's 35 of us who are ready to go and six want to stay left behind, we're going to move in one accord with the 25 who want to go to where Jesus is because when Jesus is beckoning and calling and we move, you are more than welcome to stay, but I promise you, the one accord is not because we're the same person. You don't agree with your boo thing on everything, let alone your mama. So what in the world thinks you're going to agree with somebody you only see once or twice a week? We have to be real with ourselves. You can be on one accord with just two people because that's all it says. We're two or three. The Lord said he would be. They move on a mission to fulfill the great commission because they have been called by God and prepared themselves for ministry. For the person who might be in the board of examiners, that's the candidate preparation process in the AME church or whatever process for ordination or seminary you might find yourself in. I would argue study to show thyself approved a workman or a woman that need not be ashamed rightly dividing the word of truth. Why? Because you will need to prepare yourself because when you are prepared, you are more inclined to succeed. Now, let me tell you, I have studied and still done bad on some sales. Truth be told, that's one of the reasons why I ain't got my PhD. I took that GRE and the more I studied, the worse I did. I digress, but needless to say that normally under normal circumstances, if you study, you tend to do better. And so what I'm trying to get you at is you got to prepare yourself for the move. I would argue one of the reasons we never get to the place where we can move on one accord is because we were never prepared to go anywhere. We were just telling ourselves that we were going somewhere and we heard the message of God saying prepare ourselves, be still and know and we've been still our whole life and know we were supposed to move but we've been lying to ourselves, standing in this place of sin and stagnation. Yes you were faithful to be still then but God told you you were supposed to move a long time ago. Your stillness was a season of preparation to get you ready but some of us have been still ever since he left us more than 13 years ago. Some of us have been still ever since we've been baptized. We were on fire when we first joined the church and after we started hanging around certain people or even joined the choir, which we may come to faithfully, we stopped being still and we, we kept being still when God was telling us, I want you to move. If you are in the same place you've always been, then you're not growing and you cannot be a disciple. What are you trying to say, preacher? There's a whole lot of people out here perpetrating what I call the discipleship fraud, which is this whole thing. You in the same place, been in the same place, ain't going to no new place. You are not a disciple of God being stuck because God is a dynamic God trying to do something, trying to mold something, trying to grow something in you. That's why John's gospel says in John 15, I am the vine and my father is the God. What he's getting at is the idea that if you are a plant, you will grow because growth is essential for the plant in order to be able to feed itself because when a plant grows, it's able to go through a process of photosynthesis. That's why the leaves get bigger as the plant gets bigger. And when the leaves get cut back, the plant will begin to crumble. We have to be willing to move. Our text lets us know that when the disciples move, their movement with God brings them to a place where others are able to interpret what they're doing and interpret it correctly. Meet me in the word. They move in unison. Their movement is a sermon. Peter is the one that says something but the sermon is not just in Peter's words. The sermon is the life that they have lived collectively moving on one accord. Repeat what you just said, pause, rewind, press play. The sermon is not in what Peter says. The sermon is in their movement in unity together that just so happened to be vocalized and orated by Peter in the Pentecost moment. Do not be confused and think that Peter was some superhuman preacher that would be able to cause other people to come to Christ. But rather what I would argue causes the people to be able to come to Christ is they're able to witness with integrity because they not only hear what Peter says, but they're seeing how the disciples are living their lives in unity, moving in purpose. And when the testimony of your life is a life of witness, love, and discipleship that goes more than just the lip service you say on Sunday morning or Monday or Tuesday when you walk into work and say, hey, Cheryl, how you doing? And don't talk to her the rest of the day when the life you live showcases Jesus. That's what will call somebody to want to be saved. The words we say are significant. Yes, life and death lies in the power of the tongue. But you got to be willing to witness with your life 
and many times you cannot witness by yourself. There's some people in this world who say I can do bad all by myself and baby the reason you keep doing bad is because you're all by yourself. You cannot witness in isolation absent the presence of other people. Why? Because in order for you to learn, you got to have somebody to love. And so they're able to see what they're doing, hear it spoken after they've seen it, and the response is they start communicating in a language that everybody understands. And here's where it gets good, because they're speaking in tongues, and we know how we do in the black church, and we know how we get sometimes when we start talking about tongues. What were they saying? How were they saying? Do you need an interpreter? Does it sound like an African language that neither me and you grew up speaking? Whatever it is, we know the message got heard. And I would argue sometimes we're dwelling on the significance of the gift of come here, be bougie and smart somebody. Glossolalia, the fancy Greek word for tongues. But you know, don't dwell on the glossolalic moment that occurs in the text. Dwell on the fact that a language occurred that caused familiar communication. You ever seen two kids who don't have a clue what the other person is saying because they ain't fully been able to talk to each other yet? Or ever watch babies play with each other? Babies are able to communicate. You can communicate with a baby and you don't have a clue what goo goo gaga mean. Goo goo gaga mean one thing to that person, baby. Goo goo gaga means something to another baby. But there's something about goo goo gaga that communicates a universal message of you trying to connect with somebody. And I would argue when you got the love of Jesus on the inside and the side manifesting itself on the outside and the light of Christ that's on the inside side shining on the outside. Other people will see your light shine. And we have to get to a place where our relationships with others are showcasing our light and not showcasing our darkness. But see, for some of us, we're not witnessing because we're not putting ourselves out there. We're home all alone and wonder why we ain't got no friends. We home all alone. Don't want to get on Facebook. Don't want to learn this new thing, technology. Don't want to get on Zoom, but we Zoomed out. And we wonder why we feel disconnected. This is the new normal. Zoom ain't going nowhere. We ain't having no in-person trustee meetings. Why? Because I am not driving all the way to this church when we can meet and see each other on the computer screen and get the same business done. It's a new day. And what the Bible is letting us know is that when we move with purpose, people can hear and perceive our witness. But in the midst of the masses beginning to perceive and hear the witness of God, there are some people who question what is occurring. Now, what the text lets us know in verses 5 through 9 is that because they are moving in unity of purpose and it is orated by Peter, Others are seeing it. They're getting the message and the message is causing them to connect spiritually. See, a spiritual connection goes deeper than this boot thing connection you got where she dropping it like it's hot, shaking it fast, and you out here trying to get buff and cut to have a sick pack that she probably don't even necessarily want you to have anyway. See, the issue at play is more than just the physical things that you are looking for in your relationships. If you start trying to sleep with everybody that you come in contact with and get to know at least half the people you're sleeping with, you realize you probably don't want to sleep with a third of the half that you had planned to sleep with. The moment after they opened your mouth, you would have known she was clingy by the third day. If you hadn't been like, baby, drop them drawers. I'm ready to drop it like it's hot and beat it out the front. Let's be real with ourselves. The connections that God is looking for us to make are more than just physical. They're spiritual. They saw the move of Peter and the disciples. They heard the words that Peter spoke, evidencing what they were seeing in the disciples' life. And their connection was not just physical. It had a physical response, but it was a spiritual reaction. Because when you got different people from different places, able to connect with each other from different backgrounds, don't know where you've been, don't know what you've been through, don't know the hell you had to go through on your job, don't know whether or not you're the victim of abuse, don't know what type of cancer that you got, don't know what your blood sugar glucose levels are, but I see God in you. And that God in you
you what it does is it causes me to love somebody. And I love how the songwriter says, there's a line that says, if I can love somebody while I'm traveling along, then my living will not be in vain. You can love if you live in such a way where you are opening yourself up to be lovable. But y'all know how we do. We don't want to be loved. We just want to talk about it. And we ain't got no intention on loving somebody unless they're giving us something. Want everybody else to give. Want everybody else to give. Want everybody else to give. But give me, give me, give me never gets anything because people are sick and tired of dealing with your greed. I'm in text. They get to this place, they're operating on one accord. The spirit calls this connection. They're able to interpret things that they might not have normally been able to interpret. The evidence of this comes from their haters. Notice that haters tell us something about the power of God. If different people can understand each other now in ways that they cannot understand before, we have to ask ourselves the same question that Luke asked us in verse number 12. What does this mean? You mean to tell me that I can understand the immigrant that's coming across the U.S. border if I can communicate with him through the way that the disciples were communicating? What does this mean? You mean I might be able to connect with a member of an Inuit tribe who is grappling with the loss of ice sheets that are jeopardizing their caribou fuse because of climate change? What does this mean? You mean to tell me I might be able to connect with the person who's on an opioid called crack or the white person who's on the opioid called the pill that was prescribed by a doctor but the black brother gets treated to a different setting? Anyway, you can connect with that person because you have a real relationship stemming from something that occurs that causes you to speak the same language. The same person that you thought was trying to kill you and cause you to say black lives don't matter. Is that the same person that we accused of being looting in Katrina after a hurricane with the white person who was trying to salvage food. What does that mean if we can start communicating in the same language? And the answer is simply this. The answer is the solution to our problem can come when we open ourselves up to recognizing the God in each other, each person. And by recognizing the God that is in each person, we can connect with them and form solutions to long-term problems. I know I said a mouthful. Let me say that again. The connection that we get by recognizing and being able to interpret and understand the person who is different than us is a revelation of the solution that God is trying to give us, that we are better together, have solutions when we work together and can solve many of the problems that are facing us in this world. We cannot make it in this world by ourselves. The reason many of us are failing is because we've been doing it too long, telling ourselves this lie that everything was going to be all right while week after week, month after month, even year after year, our relationships and marriages are getting worse and worse and worse. We haven't been promoted in a while. We feel like we're stuck. The bills are still due. Student loans have not gone down. We're disappointed by the fact that the Democrats cannot seem to pass anything. We're disappointed by the fact that the Republicans are not getting anything done. And we're constantly living in this place where we're complaining about what's going on. But what would happen if I opened my eyes and began to see you not as an obstacle, but as a potential help to the situation that I'm in, not because I need to use you, but because by connecting with you, I'm making my community better. What does this mean? The answer is simple. It means God has showed up. And as much as we have shouted and hollered, hooped and screamed, it means we don't have to wait till Christmas for the birth of hope in the world. It means we can grab hold of the hope right now. God has showed up. And the reason why I would argue in verse 13, they think the people are drunk is because God has been missing for so long from certain communities and from certain places and from certain jobs that we don't even know what God looks like when God shows up. There's a time and a place to act cute. There's a time and a place to act like we got it all together. But y'all, the time and place is not when God shows up. The response to the presence of God in our midst is worship because the Bible says them that worship him must worship him in spirit 
and in truth. And I believe that God is showing up. I believe that even in the midst of a pandemic, God is trying to tell us something. What do you mean, preacher? Think about it like this. God literally stopped time for almost a year and a half, allowed many of us to either work from home, get checks because we might have been laid off where we made more money than we were making before the pandemic. Many of us have been saving. Many of us have paid stuff down. Many of us have had experience that have made us stronger. And now as we prepare to re-enter the workforce, return to those places that we were going before as we re-enter into the public space, we have to ask ourselves, what has changed, and I would argue it's not the pandemic that has changed us, but it is the fact that we have been able to survive a horrible illness that has killed more than 1.5 million people globally. And the only reason you are here today is not because of the size of your bank account, not because of the pedigree you might get from your parents, but it is simply because the Lord showed up and thought it not robbery to touch you with his finger of love, allow you to live to see the bright sunshine of a new day. And every day during the pandemic, when you went to your refrigerator, one, you realized when your feet hit the ground that you could still walk, knees didn't buckle, didn't have to get hip replacement, your lights were still cut on, or at least when you opened the refrigerator, the lights came on, you had eyes that could see what was in there. You could take something out, even if it wasn't what you wanted to take out. And get yourself something to eat because God knew you needed something in order to survive. You are not here by accident. You are here because you have a purpose. Your purpose is to go ye therefore and make disciples. And far too long, Central Conference, Trinity, AME Church, we have not made disciples. If we do not make at least 50 to 100 disciples this year, I'll be honest and straight up, we don't need to be a church. We can close the doors. We can throw in the towel. We have to be part of the move of God. There are too many unchurched people here in the Manning area. There are too many unchurched people online and in the global community. There are too many of us who are not praying. There are too many of us who are not fasting. There are too many of us who are not spending enough time in the Word. And I know there's someone saying, mm, he's talking about evangelizing 50 people. Well, baby, we need to make up for lost time. So think about the ways you can contribute to the solution instead of being part of the problem. And I argue if you think more about the solution, the problem that you thought you had will begin to melt away because you'll be spending more time with God who have reminded you that you're bigger than the problem that you're concerned about right now. I'm done. God is up to something in this church. I don't know what it is, but whatever it is, I want to invite you to be a part of it because we cannot do what we're doing without you. So if you're without a church home, if you've been put off by church, if you're like me, I'm a preacher. I serve in leadership in AME Church. I can't stand church. Matter of fact, I use this term that people can't stand when I say I hate church and hate it with a passion. I am in church. I'm in front of the pulpit. Take a good look at the chancellor. It's first Sunday. We're going to have communion. I hate church. Don't like it. Don't want to be a part. It's interesting. I'm getting ready to invite you to become a part of something that I don't, I don't even like going to myself. But I say all that to say that the reason why the church is so jacked up is because people like me are in it. And Lord, if you knew the issues that I had and the things I did last night and got planned to do on tomorrow, you might question it. But I'm saying that because church is a place where even in the midst of my brokenness and hot mess self, I can come and be healed. Let's be real. I ain't the first person that's ever told you they don't like church. The reason you ain't been to church is because you don't like it out. The reason you don't want to come back to church is because you've gotten comfortable and you don't want to have to go back to dealing with the foolishness. I get it. I don't want to deal with the foolishness either. And confession, that's why I probably kept us out of church longer than we should have. But you reach a point in life where you have to recognize sometimes you get it wrong and now we have an opportunity to get it right. I'm so grateful for what God has done for me during this month of Thanksgiving. I'm prepared to return to church. I'm prepared to return to worship. I'm prepared to invite others to have authentic conversations about what we can look like as a body of Christ because the old Trinity is passed away, but the new Trinity, the new AME Church of man is emerging. And as it emerges, what will that look like? You can either join the newness of the moment or you can get left behind as we close the chapter on a dying institution. I believe the best days of the church are in front of us, but the worst days of Trinity are left behind. Let us pray. God, because you're doing a new thing and challenge us to be a part of it, we say thank you. We ask God that you would help us to accept that challenge 
Give us the fortitude to be able to move in unity after we've prepared ourselves. Give us the strength and the integrity of witness to compel others through our actions and our words to want to be in relationship with you and allow us to speak the same language because we're speaking the language of love. Allow our witness of your presence in our workspaces, on our jobs and on our homes. Cause people to question what has caused us to act differently. What does it mean? And give us the courage to be able to declare it means we decided to make Jesus the center of our joy. Perhaps there's someone under the sound of my voice who may not know who Jesus is. I invite you, send us a message. Connect with us right now. For I promise you, he's able, willing to save you if you just but hold to God's unchanging hand. Through Jesus Christ our Lord.